Build that wall. Let me refer to that phrase. Build the wall. That has become a very familiar phrase to all of us. Build that wall. Well, I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter number 21. And I want you to notice with me verses 12 and 17. Matthew, uh, excuse me, Revelation 21. And I want you to notice with me in verse number 12. Revelation 21, verse 12, the word of God says this. And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And names written therein, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now drop down with me to verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you once again for your precious and holy word. And I'm grateful, dear Lord, for this opportunity to stand behind this most precious and sacred desk here at Lifeline Baptist Church. Father, I pray this morning that you would use me as your man for the hour, that I would preach the plain sense interpretation of Bible prophecy, minus the hype, drama, or sensationalism, dear Lord. Help me, dear Lord, to honor your word by staying within the confines of the word of God, dear Lord. I pray, dear Lord, that we can uh, allow the Bible to interpret the Bible this morning. It doesn't need my help, Lord. Your word stands on its own. And Father, if there is someone here this morning, lost, undone, either one heartbeat away from going to hell, one trumpet sound away from being left behind at the rapture, I pray, dear Lord, that today would be the day of salvation because tomorrow might be too late for them. We know, Lord, that the rapture could happen at any moment at any time, without any prophecies having to be fulfilled, without any signs preceding it. We know, Lord, that it is an event that could happen without anything having to be fulfilled. It's imminent, Lord. And so, God, I pray this morning that you would help me to preach. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to preach in the spirit, not in the flesh, Lord. We ask now, Father, that you will be done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. You know, we always talk about building walls, building up walls, tearing down walls. Well, many of you probably remember this man right here on June 12, 1987 in West Berlin. The late President Ronald Reagan called on the USSR or then called the Soviet Union and their president, Mikhail Gorbachev, in which Mr. Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, this president was no joke, amen? No joke at all. And guess what? That wall got torn down. And then, of course, we see in September of 2000, Israel built a wall barrier running at least 440 miles. When you go to Israel, you're going to see that wall running about 444 miles deep into the so-called West Bank, which biblically is Judea, and Samaria, Judea being south, Samaria being the north. Israel justified building that wall to keep out Palestinian terrorists. And the moment that wall went up, the United Nations, which in my opinion is nothing but the United nothing, the United Nations and the nations of the world condemned Israel for building that wall for what? To keep Terrorist out. And then, of course, you remember on June 16, 2015, <laughs> whether you love him or hate him, amen, on June 16, 2015, at a campaign rally in New York City at uh, Trump Towers, Donald Trump, then candidate Donald Trump, said that uh, I'm going to build that wall and Mexico will pay for it. Now, as a matter of fact, he ran on two campaign promises. The first one he kept, and man, that was a doozy. He said, if I become president of the United States, I will move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. 
And this was 3,000 years coming, ladies and gentlemen, since King David conquered that very city in 2 Samuel chapter 5 from the Jebusites, making Jerusalem his capital. And Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jews for over 3,000 years. So this was 3,000 years coming. Every president ran on that promise and never kept their promise until this guy. My wife and I, three months ago, visited the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. We were renting an apartment just a block down from the embassy. And Brother Chris, when we went there, man, they were dedicating everything to Trump. There was a flagpole in honor of Donald Trump, a plaque over there in honor of Donald Trump. There was a rock over there in honor of Donald Trump. Everything was in honor of Donald Trump. And then, of course, Trump says, I will build a great wall. And nobody builds walls better than me. Believe me, I'll build them very inexpensively. And I will build a great wall. And on our southern border, and I will make Mexico pay for that wall. Mark my words. Now, I'm not sure if that happened as of yet. But he did keep that one promise. He did move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And that was, I believe it was on December the 6th of 2017. When you think about walls, and you might be familiar with this wall right here. The Great Wall of China built almost nearly 2,000 years ago. And the reason why the Chinese built that wall was to keep out Warren factions to protect the Qin Dynasty at around uh, 206 AD or so. That wall is no more than 20 uh, 30 feet high, and it runs 13,170 miles long. That's a long, long wall, amen? But it's nothing compared to the wall that is yet to come. A wall, ladies and gentlemen, that will be built by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Bible tells us that in the future, God will build a wall. And it's going to be way better than Trump's wall. Amen. It's going to be way better than the wall that the Israelis made to keep Palestinian terrorists out. It's going to be better than this great wall of China. You know how I know it's going to be better? Because it's going to be built by divine hands. Amen. It's going to be built by none other than God himself. It will be a wall that no one's going to tear down. It will be a wall that will not be breached by any type of terrorist or, or to keep warring factions out. It will be a wall that will be built around the home of the redeemed, around you, around me. That wall will surround the home of the redeemed. And that's what we read in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 12. It says, and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written therein, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. John the Apostle sees this great and high wall. This wall has 12 gates being guarded by 12 angels with the 12 names on it. The names of the tribe of the children of Israel. When you read Revelation 21, you will find that word 12 mentioned directly and indirectly. It's found 11 times in Revelation chapter number 21. You know why? 12, the number 12, you will see right here, had a wall great and high, had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names written therein, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. You'll find that number 12 some 187 times or so in the Bible. Do you know what the number 12 biblically represents? Divine government. A divine government. A perfect government. And folks, we see that divine, perfect government right here in Revelation chapter number 21. Twelve in the Bible represents divine government. It represents a perfect government. And in Revelation chapters 19 through 22, it shows a divine government of Jesus, the Messiah, that will one day replace this corrupt, finite human government that we are under right now. I mean, this is a corrupt government. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm proud to call myself an American. I pray for those in authority, pray for those in leadership, because the Bible says we need to do that. That's biblical. But we are under a corrupt, finite 
human government. All the governments of the world are finite and they are corrupt, amen? But this government will be a perfect government that will one day be headed up by the Son of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we find this 12 in Revelation chapter 21 because it represents divine government. A theocracy is reestablished. In verse number 12, he had a wall grain high with 12 gates, 12 angels, and the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Notice in verse number 13, the number 12 mentioned indirectly. On the east, how many gates? Three. Okay, what about on the north? What about on the south? What about on the west? Three, 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 three. There's 12 gates in the city. Again, 12 representing the divine governments. 12 gates which represent the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Notice in verse 14 with me. And the wall of the city had what? Here it is again. 12 foundations. And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. In verse 14, this wall has 12 foundations which contain the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. By the way, this will fulfill Jesus' promises to the disciples. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 20 and 29, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, one day you will sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And we see the fulfillment right here in Revelation chapter 21 and verse number 14. These disciples will sit on those thrones and they will be judging the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And Jesus said, yeah, they're going to do that in the regeneration. Remember that word he used in Matthew 19, 20 and 29? In the regeneration, you will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now that word regeneration that Jesus used is the Greek word paleogenesia. Do you know what paleogenesia means? It simply means Genesis again. We're going back to Genesis. And if we're going back to Genesis, that means before the fall, Revelation chapters 1 and, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, that was paradise. We're going back, ladies and gentlemen, to paradise. That's why Jesus said in the regeneration, you will sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. It will be Genesis again. A theocracy will once again be restored. Again, if you were not here for Sunday school, we talked about in the past, there was a theocracy. Genesis chapters 1 and 2. God ruled over his creation. His creation embraced his rule. But when man fell in Genesis chapter 3, that theocracy was set aside. And now we are under a satanocracy. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation 19, we have been under a Satanocracy. Satan is the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's the prince and the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Jesus calls him the prince of this world, uh, John chapter 12 and verse 31. He can transform into an angel of light. Why is the world in such a mess today? Because of the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. And you look outside today, there's a lot of disobedience out there today because of unregenerate, unsaved individuals who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. We are right now presently under a Satanocracy. But when we get to Revelation 19, that Satanocracy will end at the second coming of Jesus Christ. When he comes back at a second coming, we're coming back with him riding on white horses, amen? Coming back to Jerusalem, where one day he will establish a kingdom, a literal physical kingdom. For how many years? One thousand years. That's a literal, physical, bodily reign of Jesus Christ. Genesis, Pelic Genesia, will once again be restored, and then we will change from a Satanocracy back to a theocracy. But notice with me in verse number 16. And the city lieth four square. Yeah, I know they made a church denomination out of that. And the, and the city lieth four square. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed 12. Is there, there it is again, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So this new Jerusalem. It's going to be like a cube. 
Now, you see the, that phrase there, 12,000 frill long. A reed in the Bible is 10 feet. A cubit in the Bible is 18 inches. You want to know what a biblical cubit is? Everybody hold up your arm. Point to your elbow. Now go all the way up to the very tip of your middle finger. That's a biblical cubit. That is exactly 18 inches. A cubit in the Bible is 18 inches. A reed in the Bible is 10 feet. The city is a cube, 12,000 furlongs. Now a furlong in the Bible is 606 feet, 9 inches, about one eighth of a mile. A reed, as I said, is 10 feet in the Bible. A cubit is 18 inches from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. In other words, the new city will be 1,500 miles cubed in each direction. I'm talking north, south, east, and west. In verses 19 and 20, you will notice all these precious gems that are on the gates or the foundations of these walls. And how many gems do we read about? There are 12. See, there's that number 12. It's mentioned directly and it's mentioned indirectly in Revelation chapter 21. Verse 21 says, there are 12 gates with 12 pearls on the gates. Look at this, verse 21. And the 12 gates with 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street. <gasps> Did I emphasize that enough? <laughs> the street. <gasps> Singular. See, we always think about streets. <laughs> plural. But that's not biblical. Amen. There are no streets. <laughs> But there's only a street, <gasps> singular, one street. By the way, we're all going to be living on Main Street. Now, your pastor might have a mansion across the street from my mansion. But it's going to be on the same street, <gasps> Main Street. And that street will be paved, ladies and gentlemen, with pure gold. One street, paved with pure gold. In a cubed city that's running 1,500 miles, 12,000 12, furlongs, 1,500 miles north, south, east, and west. Man, it doesn't get any better than that, amen? Notice with me in uh, Revelation 22 and verse number 2. In the midst of the street, <gasps> singular. <laughs> I'm running out of breath here. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, wait a minute. Something's going to make a reappearance in the eternal state. A certain tree. What tree is that? Wow. The same tree of life that was mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. And when man fell, God cut off his way to that tree of life that no one can. Why would God do that? Why would God cut off the tree of life? From fallen man. Because if God would have left that tree there, man could have partaken of that tree and lived in his sin forever. God said, I can't allow that to happen. So that's the reason why God put a cherubim there to guard the tree so that nobody can have access to it. But here in the eternal state, the tree of life will make a future world appearance. Again, when you look at verse 12, going back to chapter 21. It's, it describes that wall, great and high. And then the angel in verse 17, he's measuring that wall. And in verse 17, he measures that wall at 144 cubits. Wow, that's, that's crazy, 144 cubits. As I said, a biblical cubit is 18 inches from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. So, doing a little bit of math here. If we take 144 cubits times 18, that wall will be 2,592 feet high. That's going to shoot from Earth's atmosphere out into outer space, ladies and gentlemen. That's a very big, big wall. I mean, that's almost going to, look at this, the city line four square. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. Again, the reed is 10 feet in the Bible. 12,000 furlongs of length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. That's going to be one huge city and one huge wall. That's the Empire State Building right there. That wall will almost be the size of two 
Empire State Buildings. The Empire State Building in New York City is about 1,454 feet tall. I'm talking to the very tip of the needle there. 1,454 feet. Now, this wall will come short, 298 feet short of two Empire State Buildings. That wall will be 2,592 feet high. The city is a cube running 1,500 miles according to Revelation 21, 16 in each direction with a 2,592 foot high wall. And this cube city will come out of Earth's atmosphere up into space. This is going to be one big, big city. And this emanates from what city? Exactly. Well, that's the earthly Jerusalem today. But then the Bible talks about this new Jerusalem that will one day come down over this new planet Earth and you and I will have access to either or, to the new Jerusalem and the new Earth. How would we do that, by the way? Well, you see, we got raptured seven years earlier, did we not? So if we got raptured, that means you dropped what? That body of flesh you're in right now. And we received what type of body? That's right, my brother. We receive a glorified body. Now, those who go into the millennial kingdom prior to the eternal state, they get saved in the tribulation period. They survive the tribulation period. They go into the kingdom in what type of bodies? Natural. No natural body. So they didn't get raptured. They got left behind in the tribulation period. They survive the tribulation period. They go into the kingdom in their natural bodies, which means they'll be able to do something in the kingdom you and I won't be able to do in our glorified bodies. You know what that is? Have kids. And still sin too, exactly. They'll sin and they'll be able to have babies in the kingdom. And believe it or not, Ezekiel 47 says animal sacrifices will be reinstituted. Don't ask me why. I'll ask Jesus Christ when I get to heaven. I'm sure he'll have an explanation for that, okay? I'm still trying to figure that one out. But I, the, the closest I can come to is that those sacrifices in the kingdom point to Jesus Christ as a memorial. His once and for all sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. But in the eternal state, everything will be absolutely perfect. Paleg Genesia, Genesis again, paradise restored, and yet Revelation 22, 2, the tree of life makes another future world appearance. This city emanates from the holy city of Jerusalem as earth's capital. Jesus reigns from David's throne from Jerusalem in the millennial temple during the millennial kingdom reign of Jesus the Messiah from Jerusalem. At the end of that 1,000 years, there's going to be a new heavens, there's going to be a new earth, that new Jerusalem will come down. Uh, back up with me to chapter 21 quickly here. We only got a few minutes here. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. The word of God says this. Revelation 21, 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. Wow. In the eternal state, heaven comes to earth. A new earth and a new heaven. The new Jerusalem descends to this new earth. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And uh, by the way, that's not some New Testament concept of this new heaven and new earth. The Jewish prophet Isaiah Right in 700 years earlier before the Lord Jesus Christ, Isaiah prophesied of this new heaven and new earth. He did in Isaiah 65, 17 and Isaiah 66, 22. He talks about the new heavens and he talks about the new earth. John the Apostle picks up on Isaiah's prophecy right here in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. The Jewish prophet Isaiah prophesied of this new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah prophesied about the millennial kingdom. Remember, if you were here for Sunday school, Isaiah nine six, uh, Isaiah chapter uh, six verses nine through eleven. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf, the young lion, the fat one together. A little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. The young one shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. This all takes place in the millennial kingdom. The animal kingdom will be in harmony. Is that the case right now? I don't know if you ever watched Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. With, how many remember that? 
Marlon Perkins, you know, you're watching that tiger just coming up on that poor defenseless little animal and then just, rah, just pounces right on him. Well, that's the animal kingdom. Listen, the animal kingdom today is carnivorous. But in the kingdom, they will become herbivorous. Won't be eating the meat anymore. Won't be attacking each other anymore. The Bible says the cow and the bear shall feed. The young ones shall lie down together. Is that going on right now? So stop saying we're in the kingdom. The Bible says that even the venomous snakes will be tamed. They won't be venomous anymore. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. That's a venomous snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand on a cockatrice den. A cockatrice is a cobra in the Bible. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's in the millennial kingdom. But at the end of that 1,000 years, heaven comes down to earth. The atmosphere of this planet is burned up. Now, the planet is not destroyed into a billion pieces. I hear that all the time. Well, the earth's going to blow up one day, Brother Rosado. And what does it say that in the Bible? The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, the earth abideth forever. It's the surface of the planet that's destroyed. That's 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. One day God will purify all evil off this planet. All sin, all evil. And then that new Jerusalem will come down over that new earth. And you and I will have access to either or. No more corruption. No more wickedness. No more sin. It will be pure righteousness in the eternal state. In the millennial kingdom, you'll have some sin going on. But Jesus Christ will be right there to crush that. Amen? But in the eternal state, it's Palig Genesia. It's Genesis restored again. A theocracy is restored again. Jesus Christ is ruling as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with Jerusalem as earth's capital at that time. I'll tell you, it doesn't get any better than that. And then we see that Etz Chaim, fly away again, there you go. We see, they're like that, I know. You see that tree of life, once again restored, Revelation 22 and verse number 2. The tree of life, Etz Chaim, as they say in Hebrew, will make a reappearance on the world stage. And we see this tree mentioned in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. It was lost when man fell into sin in Genesis chapter 3. Then John refers to this tree of life in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. And by the way, that tree of life in the book of Revelation will fulfill Ezekiel's prophecy of the tree of life coming back on the scene in the future. In Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse number 12, it says this, Because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be meat, and the leaf thereof medicine. You know what's parallel? To Ezekiel 47, 12, about that tree of life, the fruit being food and the leaf medicine. Well, look again in Revelation 22, 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there a tree of life, which bear, there's that number again, 12. Perfect government, divine government. 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for what? The healing of the nations. Ezekiel, in chapter 47, verse 12, says that the leaf will be for medicine. John says that the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How do you think people in their natural bodies in the millennial kingdom are going to be able to live for a thousand years? How is that possible? In my estimation, they're probably partaking of that tree of life in order to live for that 1,000 year period in those natural bodies. Now you might have another explanation, I'd be more than happy to hear it from you, but that's the best that I can come up with. We're gonna be able to live there because we're in glorified bodies. So that's a cinch right there. But those guys in natural bodies, how in the world will they live for a 1,000 years? Partake of that tree of life. Now in the eternal state, the Bible doesn't tell me what's gonna happen. To them, they might receive a glorified body in the eternal state, I don't know, the Bible doesn't uh, tell us. So we see Ezekiel's fulfillment in Revelation 22, 2. Within this wall will be only righteous people. Will be righteousness and will be holiness. There'll be no immorality. 
There'll be no sin. There'll be no evil. There'll be no murder. There'll be no sexual immorality. All the garbage that you and I see right now will not be in existence in the eternal state. Amen. All that's going to be gone. Amen. Why? Because the king of kings will be there. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. A theocracy, folks is once again established. Peter the Apostle makes reference to this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where, he, where it says this, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that you may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. Man, the eternal state, the norm of the day, will be nothing but righteousness. That will be the norm of the day, folks. Righteousness, holiness. We're going to be there in garments of white, which represents purity, which represents holiness. By the way, when we come back with Jesus at a second coming, guess what you're wearing? You're wearing purity. You're wearing white robes, amen? Representing purity, representing righteousness, representing holiness. But the people who will not be there, and I repeat, the people who will not be there are mentioned in Revelation 21, verse number 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. They will have no part, ladies and gentlemen, in the eternal state. Who are these people? Well, Brother Chris, the fearful are cowards. Unbelieving are atheists, agnostics. Even though the Pope just recently said, well, atheists, whether they believe or not, they're on their way to heaven anyway. I don't know what type of Bible he's reading. The abominable, homosexuals, murderers, whoremongers, those who practice sexual immorality, sorcerers, those who practice witchcraft, idolaters, pagan worship, all liars will not be allowed, ladies and gentlemen. They will not be allowed in the eternal state. Right. Listen, if you want to reserve your spot in the eternal state, you better punch your ticket now. And how do you punch your ticket now? You punch your ticket by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to come into your life to be your Lord and personal Savior. And when you do that and you mean business with him, he will save you from your sins. He will seal your salvation unto the day of redemption. And you'll be ready for either one or two things. You'll be ready for either death or you'll be ready for the next main event on God's calendar of events we call the rapture of the church. But you need to punch your ticket in the here and now. It's, it, it only makes sense to get saved now because tomorrow may be too late. The new heavens, the new earth, Jesus Christ is going to build a wall better than any politician would. And it's going to be a wall that's going to skyrocket into the heavens, man. And nothing sinful, nothing wicked, nothing evil is going to breach those walls. So before you can have the eternal state, before you can have the millennial kingdom, before you can have a second coming, before you can have a seven year period of tribulation to come, the next main event on God's calendar of events will be the rapture of the church of the living God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, <laughs> caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why I blow my shofar. I bought this in Israel in 2010. I blow the shofar. This is a shofar. Are you with me? Shofar so good? This is a shofar. 
Whenever you read about that trumpet in the Bible, it's always referring to a shofar, a ram's horn. I think we, do we have any ram's horns on the table? I'm not sure if we do. Maybe a few left. About four left that we brought back from Israel. Oh, three left that we brought back from Israel. A ram's horn. Joshua chapter 6, verses 4, 5, 6, 8, 13. Five times tells us the priest blew the trumpet of ram's horn. That's a shofar. One day a shofar is going to sound. It will be so loud the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Come up hither. And the Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're out of here. Amen. We're out of here. That's why we read in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Paul said, if any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. And then he says, Maranatha. Maranatha is a beautiful Aramaic expression that simply means our Lord come. And how convenient it is to end off the canon of scripture, to end off the word of God with something positive for the church. He which testified these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. He is coming back. But can you imagine what that eternal state would look like? Let me just show this brief video and then we're going to be dismissed. And uh, our brother's going to, uh, he's got that all covered right there. It's a brief, I didn't like the music that accompanied this, so I had to replace uh, the music. But I think it's a good presentation here. I love this song, though. This is what we're looking for right here, folks. That's the next event we're looking for. Nothing. No signs precede that event. No prophecies have to be fulfilled. It's imminent. Could happen at any moment, any time. We don't look for signs, but we are indeed listening for the sound.
second and we'll let you go thank you upstairs I appreciate it with every head bowed every eye closed just for a brief moment our sister is going to come up and just play a brief song of invitation here why would you want to miss out on something like that to reign with Jesus Christ forever and forever either he can be your savior now or one day he will be your judge He'll either say to you one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Or one day he'll look at you and say, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What will he say to you one day? Will he be your savior today or your judge tomorrow? doesn't have to be that way. Trust in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Give us that opportunity to show you from the Bible how you can know for sure without a shadow of a doubt that one day heaven will be your home. By simply raising your hand this morning, all you're telling me is this. August, please pray for me. I need to get saved. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to die and go to hell for the rest of eternity. I want Jesus to be my Savior right here and right now. If that's you, just slip your hand up and put it down. That's all you need to do. I see that hand. God bless you, my friend. I see that hand. Praise the Lord. Would there be another hand here this morning? August, pray for me. I need to get saved. I've been playing church too long now. I need to get saved. Anybody else? August, pray for me. Pastor Chris, pray for me. I need to get saved. Anybody at all? All right, let me ask you this. If you are saved and you know it and you know you're ready to go, whether by death or rapture, you know you're ready to go. If you are saved... Would you raise your hand as a testimony? Just keep your hands up for a second, please. If you're saved, okay, I see. Many, 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 many hands. Praise the Lord, thank you. You can put your hands down. Our sister's going to play a song of invitation. Pastor Chris is going to come up. If you raise your hand for salvation, I want to encourage you. I'm going to stand right here. When you hear that piano music playing, I want you to come forward and give me that opportunity to show you from the word of God how you can know for sure without a shadow of a doubt that one day heaven will be your home. Our Father, we thank you again for your precious word. Father, as we look at this eternal state, Lord, the new heavens, the new earth, that cubed city, that extremely high wall, Lord, what a time that is going to be, Lord, living in a place full of righteousness, holiness, where there will be no more corruption, no more sin, no more immorality, Lord. No more wars, no more fighting. It'll just be pure righteousness. And Lord, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to miss out on that. I wouldn't want my worst, my worst enemy to be, be left behind at the rapture, Lord. To die and go to hell for the rest of eternity. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. That they not walk out of this building until they settle that eternal question. Father, we ask now that your will be done. May your Holy Spirit have his will and way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If God is speaking to you, I want you to come forward.